Thank you so much, both of you. I'm going to start off the discussion, but with, uh, I think, a real simple question for the two of you, and maybe a very slightly more complicated <laughs> question for you, but don't worry. You two have made a lot of films, and, and I want to ask you, in what ways, it, it's, I can guess, I think, how different this is from the other work you've done. But what other work of yours does it remind you of? And what that you've done has prepared you for this project? I, I, uh, in my description of what I do, I, I mentioned that I've always been interested in social issues that are unexplored. And I, the answer directly to that question was in 1988, Anne and I went to a small town in upstate New York and started making films about children who were born in poverty and raised in poverty. And the exploration with those kids, we didn't talk to their parents, we only talked to the children. We were absolutely spent time trying to find out what their world was like. I think that that probably prepared me the best of being able to really ask questions, find the future for these children. And I think that was one of the social issue programs that we made that started my influence. And, and also, um, having studied math, I really had no background in filmmaking until we just started making films. And my uh, schooling came at the Robert Flaherty Film Seminars, where we learned the concept of non-preconception, which means that you observe the world and you try to bring it to others. And that's really what we try to do in every film we've ever made. And doing a personal film is really, I'm like so nervous. <laughs> I know so it's, many it's people in the audience. It's a selfie, if you notice. Uh, it's, it's like a selfie. Um, but it became too complicated a story, so we felt that a film would be the more efficient way to tell it. And Alex, I, I think I actually caught you saying this word uh, that I used in introducing you mm -hmm. uh, in, in your voiceover. Did you say somewhere the spolia of history? <laughs> and, in an, and whether you did or you didn't in the movie, I think you did. Um, in, in what way do you see Junkov as an example of the spolia that you work with? And, and how is it like and different, uh, the detritus that's produced in the ordinary course of production and consumption? Uh, yeah, complicated question. I mean, I want to kind of get into a whole big uh, historiography lecture here, which I can't even do anyway to begin with. Uh, but I mean, for me, the interesting thing about spolia versus adaptive reuse is that there's a kind of cultural dimension to it. Uh, adaptive reuse is basically this was once, you know, three buildings and now become one thing. And in a way, these, you know, the memory of these buildings and may, may or may not necessarily be there. Uh, in the case of uh, Jankov the Abdrosian, in the case of this story, I, I knew that there was going to be something that uh, will 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 make us reckon with the with the past, and not just that, but also have that past kind of come and essentially you know land on our laps and make us change the way we see the world today, the way we kind of wake up and see the world tomorrow, and so on and so forth. I mean that's the most powerful aspect of any kind of you know spolio or or artifact that is to me interesting, and this is definitely the case in point. And we've got a very nice big audience tonight, so I don't, without further ado, I'm going to start taking, we'll start taking your questions, yes.
Funding for what? <laughs> I, no, I, I think he's asking for an update. Well, the update is that we really have no progress since we made this film. It's really, it's, we went with the idea that it would be met with something like we might meet in America. Oh, you've done this beautiful job and really you've taken a first step. And Cornell University supported this in a very nice both monetary and time fashion. So we were hoping that all those things would come together in some way and, and make it appealing to them there. We realize that here's a big problem and, and one of the things that we face is that all the people that live in that neighborhood, except for a small number of German people who stayed, are all new people there from Lvov. Stalin moved everybody out and moved in a large Ukrainian community that has no ties to this. So our job, if it, if it is, is to find the people who will pay attention to this, the German minority, the, the people who are still there that, that lived in this place in the, four, in the 50s and 60s, and try to, try to get some sort of a, a parade going of people that have an idea for this place. So it is up to Anne and me to do anything with this, if it happens at all, which is something very, we want to have more support from, from America, maybe. We hope you all brought your checkbooks. Yeah. <laughs> is, is there a real estate developer in the house? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, it's wireless. Oh, right, that oh question. cool. And then, uh, oh, I, they're bringing the microphone and then you say. Okay. Um, I've had my own experience in looking into family property in Silesia, what was formerly Silesia, in Chorzów, Poland, which was Koenigshutte. Um, and my experience has been, and I've been to Polish archives, that the land records are in the county or the town land registry offices and that in order to get access, you basically have to start a, a reclamation action in court because of the very, very strict Polish privacy laws. It has nothing to do with Jews at all. Uh, a lot of it, I think, is based upon Germans reclaiming property. But the bottom line is in order to get access, and there are maps from the 1920s and 30s which shows who owns the land. Uh, you need to do that. And I was curious, looking at the film, that, that doesn't show that you actually went to any uh, land registry offices or the county clerk in New York City, for example. To be honest about claiming it, it really is for sale for $300,000. It's like, it's a very, that's, I mean, that's nothing compared to the money that needs to go into it to develop it into anything worthwhile. So it's, it's, it's almost free, you know, when you look at the, the 300,000 is a bunch, but it's not what we need to rebuild the place. Yeah, and, and we got the, um, um, the claim record from Berlin of what my grandmother filed, which was an extensive description of the property. And then when we met Balka von Schweinischen, he had his father's copy of the maps and the deeds. So we saw a lot of documentation describing the property and its historical, um, you know, uh, background. Um, but it was, it was tricky working in those archives. They have strange rules and, you know, they also don't remember things also, which was quite uh, surprising. And we did have the help of somebody who was really behind us and really helped us a lot until we started to talking to Balga von Schweinischen and then she just disappeared. There was anger that couldn't be addressed by somebody who was really very helpful. <laughs> and um, it, it stopped that, that point right off. Um, I was wondering, so, at the beginning, you spoke about how there was some sort of collective amnesia about when you mentioned your, your great-grandparents, people didn't seem to remember. Um, and then also at the end, um, you spoke about how the synagogue was burned down during Kristallnacht. So I was wondering if it had occurred to you at any point that maybe this amnesia came out of some discomfort that maybe they knew what happened or they felt uncomfortable with their own maybe anti-Semitic sentiments or anything like that. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, Eastern Europe is such a is such a cipher. You know, it really is. It's fascinating to me, um, and I, I don't claim to really understand it. Even studying Polish to try to help to get some sense of it, um, 
only made it even more confusing, but amnesia is a very common reaction. I think especially um, people of our age, when our parents just absolutely wouldn't talk about the war, it just was off the table. And um, when you become curious, what I did later in life, everyone had already died. So it was difficult. Then you go back to this town, which has actually got displaced people, not the same people. They are gone. These are new people. And so you can't blame them. They didn't know what had happened. And they also were trained not to ask questions. And they came from horrible displacements of their own. So the layers of, of pain are, are very, very thick. You know, the only thing that we've been able to really identify that everybody gets behind, and I'll, I'll, this is anecdotal and not proven, that the women in Poland, in this particular part of Poland, are tasked with the job of raising their children until their children are in college. And when the kids are in college, they start taking care of their parents until they die. This town and a lot of towns in Poland desperately need daycare. They need daycare for the children when they're, when they're young and for their elderly when they're there so that women can have a normal life. And everybody that we talk about that with goes, yes, that's great, we need it. And those, those developers and those people that were in the local county seat, they love the idea, but they're, the place where we have to start exploring is this German minority that has a feeling for it, but I'll also, uh, please. No, I just uh, I kind of remembered that we uh, visited two other sort of case studies, right, which are similar sort of situations of states that one became essentially a memorial, because it happened to be the where the, the Chrysler Circle was discovered, and the other one was essentially a kindergarten, right? So there was either memory or kids. These are the kind of two, two extremes. I, I've been, I think, I've never said this to you, but I think since I first saw, saw the film, it seemed to me like this is an EU project because of, yeah, because of, of everything that comes together in it. And the last meeting we had in, in Wrocław as we were leaving was with a person from the EU who said, Poland has not done what it's been tasked to do by the EU. They haven't spent enough money. We have matching funds for anything like this. So I mean, it's, it's absolutely, it needs the Poles to say, we'll put up the money that will lead the EU money right behind it, and matching money. But uh, Steve had his, uh, do you mind if we just the first <coughs> Sure, pull another frame. Uh, I, I couldn't help but be impressed with the perseverance, and I knew I would stop at some point, and there had to be some low points where you were like, like why am I doing this? What, what pulled you forward? Hi, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, turning around every time we got really depressed and having somebody say, this is a great idea, somebody has to do it. Well, and, also, yeah. and I would also say in the digital age, you know, when this is to a certain degree out on the internet, there's reversingoblivion.com, it's a website. Just on New Year's Day, I get an email from Yuri Eisner, whose family lived in Gutentag, and the Eisners now live in Israel. And right in the audience, right behind you, Steve, is, is Miriam and Naomi Lumen, also from Gutentag, who I have met. This is what keeps me going. Yeah, absolutely. How about, that works. How about, how about toward the back? And if there was a question up there, too. For the people in the back. If you could. Hold, hold on, hold on a second. Two seconds. Thank you for watching. Thank you. It's a really well done movie. And um, I'm just curious, number one, in doing this, I've been to Wroclaw and to Częstochowa, which it seems like it's nearby. My father was from that area. And in doing this, did you meet the rabbi, Michael Shudrick, of the... and? In, did this spark any of your Judaism, and were you able to find out anything from the, the past of your family? And well, <laughs> well, I invited Rabbi Emily Korzenich, but I don't think she made it here. Um, 
No, I didn't really meet um, uh, any rabbis or any people, um, uh, Jewish people in, in Poland. There, re there really aren't that many. Um, There's 15,000 Jewish people in Poland. Yeah. And Rabbi Michael Shudrick is the chief rabbi yeah. of Poland in Warsaw, though. The Judaism, you know, for me was um, a surprise. And it, it, it didn't really make too much difference in my life. I'm not a religious person. So, um, you know, a, a lot of the concepts of Judaism I really, I really appreciate. But, but um, being, a, I would never say that I'm a Jewish, I mean, I don't identify with it, I guess I would say. Um. Could I ask a question since I'm right over here? Yes, of course. <laughs> um, I, I noticed that you cut towards the end um, to the cemetery. Uh, what was the purpose of that? I think, it was, I think it was to address exactly what you were bringing up about that we started realizing the Jewish heritage that had been lost and didn't want to, it, it, it was between the synagogue and meeting the person in the synagogue and the Jewish experience of the cemetery, you couldn't help but feel that there was something lost spiritually that it wasn't just an emotional thing about the farm, that there was a spiritual side of this too that had been lost and had been ignored. Yeah, I would say that it's, it's definitely about loss. I mean, there were so many Jews in Poland and they're gone, and, and this is such a, an oblivion that is kind of incredible. It's sort of, it's, it's unfathomable about, about what has been lost. But there are these, this physical spoiler, I mean, maybe it's not the right use of the word, but it's evidence of their existence oh, and you know so you can't deny it and like Junkhoff became very compelling to me because it's not just a story it's a place it's still there it's been through a lot but it is still there and and the cemetery is still there so you can tell whatever stories you you want to tell but there are physical you know there's there's places that you you can't deny their existence right it, it felt like a story of assimilation where it, it, it was more important to fix up a place and completely turn into a place where you would forget that there were ever Jews over there, as opposed to trying to raise the money for a museum where you could ra raise money from Jews all over the world, or maybe even more important, fix up the cemetery that was over there. The, the cemetery has been the cemetery has been the site of a lot of um, it, a, a lot of Israeli students have come and worked on the cemetery. It's been a very it's it's actually in pretty good shape for what it was. Uh, can, can, sorry, just a, kind of the point of memory. It it it, it was something that I was one way or the other somehow circling back to. And then to me, the, the most potent memorial, I think, in this place is the place itself. In, in its current uh, state, which suggests that it, it's been in the past and it's going into the future somehow, with all of its idiosyncrasies, with the idea that there was at some point this kind of Soviet barracks built in there, the, with the idea that there are certain things were added, certain things were destroyed, with this kind of lonely grave. So like all, all these kind of layers of, of, of the past and the way tell the story better than anything else if you are looking. So I would frankly love to see like a memorial stone somewhere that says, oh, this was this, this, and this, and this. I think it would be a missed opportunity. So, I mean, you know, cemeteries aside, but the, the place itself definitely has kind of, I don't know, like a, essentially you walk into like the, you, you, you can cut the history with a knife, so to speak, you know? Um, the uh, complexity of the film and knowing you and knowing how long you've taken to do it is uh, very interesting because of the different people that entered into it at various moments and the feeling as they are talking about the cemetery and the destruction of the cemetery and the sadness you feel uh, because the oblivion is so complete you don't feel the Jewishness of that community until you go into that cemetery and see the destroyed uh, stones and you, and you walking through it, you feel this Jewishness lost and the spirit of that Jewishness lost. But the idea of what replenishes a place is amazing, it's the spirit of a person and all the different, each individual people that came into your life from the recording people to the radio story. But I find your role astounding 
because your role links a whole young generation of forward-thinking architect students, and you saw the idea of bringing them there. So the idea of the physical, how you got them there, who supported it, their travels, and the effect that that place had on them when they were measuring the exact buildings as they were, and then the idea of conceptualizing with modern ideas and digital technology, the future of it, and uh, what the residue experience was for them once they finished and got back, and what they shared with you, and how it affected them after. So it's sort of two layers of questions, I, but I guess it's like a, a movie, I'm I, sorry. I mean, the, the, the short answer is yes. I mean, I think they were profoundly affected by far more than I was because they had no idea. I mean, they're in a way kind of, they were innocent, you know, whatever, 20 year olds who like had very kind of little clue what, what's, what's about to, to happen. And at this point they've all graduated. And every now and again I kind of get a message saying like, oh, you know, we remember this, this and this. So it, it's definitely, if nothing else, selfishly for them, for their education and for us, it was definitely a tremendous opportunity. So the fact that these two just showed up on my doorstep one day and said, hey, let's do this. I'm like, I'm already immensely grateful for that. So thank you for, for, for that. The, the architecture school is indebted to you. But I've got to say that we met Alex through our godchildren. Both of them are architects. One of them had studied with Alex, and they said, if you want to know something, go talk to Alex. So, That's true. Judah, I think we'll take maybe two more questions. Uh, so as a Jewish film critic, I cannot even enumerate how many films I've seen in the last decade and a half on the Holocaust. An, an unbelievable number of films, books, um, and I want to just ask you if, if there's been any change. Like it seems to me around 10 years ago you had f novels and films like Everything is Illuminated, My Grandfather's House, um, books like Neighbors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was a real opening up uh, 15 to 10 years ago on this subject of people going back, of people finding properties, a lot of nonfiction, fiction books and films. Um, and then uh, things start to change about five years ago. I may have been one of the only Jewish film critics who really hated Ida, found Ida incredibly anti-Semitic. Um, and then there has been a very noticeable turn in Poland and in other places in Eastern Europe, um, right wing, H do you find that there, in your time of going back and forth there's been any change that has affected your project? I, I think the most, the most dramatic change for me was how important it is for us to tell this story. We were in um, the mining town. Um, Katowice. In Katowice, sorry, excuse me. We were in Katowice and we were ta taken on a tour of all of the beautiful old mining village that's there in Katowice by some people who wanted to promote this for Hollywood production. They knew we were New York filmmakers, they wanted to show us this. And we said, well, is there anything, you know, is there anything that represents Jews here? And they said, oh, there were no Jews here in Katowice. So it's like, these are the young people that need to know this story. So to answer your question, this, this, this really is a very necessary part of Polish life. It needs to be a part of it. It needs to be dragged in front of these children. We were, we were lucky enough to speak for quite a while to a number of English classes where they wanted to, these kids in, in the local high school had never talked to a native English speaker, so they wanted, we were dragged in many times to talk to them. And you know, it was like they were fascinated by this story, but nobody had been there to talk to them about it, about the f Jews that had lived in Dobrogen. And the one thing we were never able to talk about, they just said, don't talk about, about lesbians and gays. <laughs> That's the one thing that you can't talk about. You can talk about everything else. So there's a lot of, in other words, there's a lot of repression in many, many ways in Poland right now, and especially around this story. And it really is an important thing in Poland. And, and I would love the connections to the, to the Polish community that we could go and talk to. Was your rabbi in Warsaw an Iranian Jewish rabbi? And Katowice was in the synagogue for 13 years back since after World War II. Oh, yeah. But these kids knew nothing. You know, they were 20 and 25 years old. They took us to incredible sites that we could make a great film about whales that looked like Welsh mining town, you know. So that's what they were promoting. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, Poland is so complicated, and it, it's really taking a, a turn to the right. Um, its politics are, are, are not pretty um, at all, and there is still a real reluctance to talk about Jews and the Jewish loss um, to that whole country. Um, when we first went there, and there was a sort of a town meeting where the Germans played the radio feature for the locals, um, I was advised by David Ost in particular, who was our, our best contact there, to really n to make it clear that I wasn't a Jew coming back to claim something, that that would just close the doors. And, um, you know, again, my interest was to meet people and to, to get them to, to, to trust me or to, to tell me things, to open up. And I didn't want any doors closed. And so I, I, I did take that advice and, and you know, I just went as an American whose family was from there and um, was interested. And we have since met um, the communists who were living there as the directors of the collective farm that it became. And, and that, that could be another film in itself. We didn't put it in this film because it was long enough. Um, but there's many, many more stories to come out, but there's so much suppression, there's so much oblivion that it's kind of incredible. I, I'm actually going to, uh, I thought of a great closing line, but I, I got one more question of my own that I want to sneak in <laughs> before we break up. And this is a question about the aesthetics of the film. The one sort of arty touch that I see there is the birch trees, which are almost sort of like a wash background. You certainly treated them in some ways. What affect, I mean, are you consciously implanting some affect there? What do you guys think about it, when you it see It was those originally scenes? shot on the train from Perm in the Urals to Moscow, a 24-hour train trip, and I was just bored and shot out the window. So it's far with away. A, so it's far away. It's, it's out of a train window. But then when I thought about it in the context of this, I swear that the exact route of her grandparents from Bratislav, from Breslau, to Terezin is online. The stops they took, the places they went, the people they picked up, the list of people on the train, it's all completely documented. And I thought, this is the train trip that they took. That's really what it was, and we, we made it, we made it as our friend, well, we, we screwed it up, we made it perfect. We, at different points in the movie, it is different quality, and it's where our vision was at the time of the, in the place of the movie. It's also an, a real image, it's not a synthetic image, and it's of nature, and so it had a real, and, and this was a farm, so it, it had a lot of resonance there, it had motion, um, and I mean, Poland looks like that as, as does Russia. A lot of it is, you know, birch trees and. and but it's also a trope. We saw it a bunch in other movies books. in, in you're, Germany. You're, our yeah. film scholar might have seen train images. Uh, Just exactly at, like that. Over we and over realize, again. oh my God, we've got a meme here. But, yeah. <laughs> well, I do want to conclude then by saying how, how wonderfully and in some ways sadly appropriate it is to have the first, the honor of the first New York showing of this film in an institution that is of course devoted to resisting and reversing oblivion every day in the myriad little ways that we can. And what an honor it is to be your neighbor and your colleague and to invite, thank everyone for coming and to invite you to join us and consider, continue the conversation in a reception outside. <laughs>